Good afternoon, and welcome to Women, Leadership, and the Law, a discussion with women leaders on rising in the profession. My name is Jamie Augustinski. I am a senior attorney with the Axelrod firm in Philadelphia, and I will be your moderator for today's panel. We have a really great discussion planned for you this afternoon, so thank you so much for attending. Before we get started, I did just want to announce that we will have time for questions at the end of the panel. So there is a question and answer button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So if you have any questions throughout the panel discussion for our panelists, please put your question in that question and answer function and um, the panelists will address it at the end of the panel. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panel for this afternoon. First, we have Cheryl L. Axelrod. Cheryl is the president and CEO of the Axelrod firm. She provides strategic results-driven advice and representation to companies and governmental bodies regarding their commercial and employment litigation matters. Her commercial litigation cases have been the subject of Law 360 articles, and she has been recognized by her peers as one of the top 100 super lawyers in Pennsylvania and one of the top 50 women super lawyers in Pennsylvania. She is a senior fellow in Litigation Council of America, our sponsor today, which is a by invitation only organization of top trial lawyers that accepts less than one half of 1% of the country's lawyers. Outside of the courtroom, Cheryl has served and continues to serve in numerous capacities at the highest levels of diversity, equity, and inclusion work. In addition to regularly speaking and publishing in the space, she co-founded the nonprofit, The Fearless Women Network, founded the Temple Law Alumni Association Women's Initiative, Diversity Committee, Women's Champion Award, and the Diversity Leadership Award. And she also serves on the Philadelphia Bar Association's Chancellor's Diversity Advisory Panel. For her DEI work, she has been awarded the National Association of Minority and Women-Owned Law Firms Yolanda Coley Advocacy Award, a Diversity Law Institute Award, and the Temple Law Alumni Association Women's Champion Award. Next, we have Danielle Corsione. Danielle is the practice group leader of the Government and Corporate Investigations Group at CSG Law. She is also a member of the firm's executive committee. She focuses her practice on white collar criminal defense, internal investigations, and complex civil litigation. Danielle has extensive experience conducting internal investigations into allegations of sexual misconduct. She is sensitive to the complex issues faced by survivors of sexual assault and leads her investigations with independence and compassion. Danielle started her career in big law, served as an assistant U.S. attorney in the criminal division of the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of New Jersey, and as senior privacy counsel at Avon Products, Inc., Danielle's practice requires navigating through the unprecedented. One of her strengths is creating space for individuals and organizations when they are going through their worst moments. Clients hire her to help them see through to the other side. And finally, we have Afsar Farman Farmanyan. She is general counsel, managing director of Varagon Capital Partners, a leading private credit manager specializing in senior secured loans to performing, private equity-backed U.S. middle market companies. As of March 31st, 2022, the firm has approximately $15.1 billion in assets under management. Since its inception in 2014, Varagon has invested more than $21 billion in middle market loans. AFSAR oversees all things legal and regulatory for Varagon and used to co-lead the firm's compliance program as well. Her projects range from fund formation and leverage facilities to joint ventures, M&A equity investments, litigation, CLOs, launching and managing a business development company under the 1940 Act, HR matters, and anything else that comes to the door. Previously, AFSAR also established and maintained Varagon's compliance program as a registered investment advisor with the SEC. Thank you ladies so much for being here today. I know we have a great discussion ahead of us. Um, all right, so we have a lot to cover, so let's dive right into it. Um, as we just heard, you know, you all have very prestigious positions now, so I think it would be really great if you can tell us, um, at what point in your career did you realize the position that you hold now is the one that you wanted to have, and what were some of the key things that you had to do to realize your goal of reaching that? Let's start with you, Cheryl. Hi, well, thank you so much, Jamie, um, for the very kind introductions. Um, it's, it's an honor to be on this panel with this, these esteemed uh, fellow speakers. 
Um, so I just want to start back a, a second and just say that um, when I started out, I had a lot of challenges that I faced. Um, and I'm going to, going to tell these quick stories just to hope to inspire other people that may have them too. So when I was very young, I was a horrible speller. Um, and I nearly flunked French in high school because if I had one accent or one letter wrong, the whole word was marked wrong. Um, so I did very poorly in that. Um, and in, um, as a, a, in law school, um, my first paper that I handed in, I was an economics major in college. The first paper I handed in came back to me with so much red ink that, I mean, I, I clearly bombed the paper, but it, it had so much red ink on it, I was crying. Um, but after um, 24 hours, when I reread everything, there was so much valuable information there, and I learned so much from it that it really helped me a lot. Um, another big uh, difficulty I faced was when I wanted to get on the moot court team. Um, I knew I wanted to be a litigator, and I really wanted to start getting experience on my feet. And I first tried out for it, and I also bombed. Um, but then I spoke to the person who won the moot court competition in front of the school, the Polsky competition at Temple Law School, and he prepped with me. And as a result of that, I actually not only got on the moot court team, but I won the competition. And it's been kind of like that in my career that I've learned by doing, which is what we do as lawyers. Um, and I've decided that failure is just um, a, a way along the road to success, and it's never going to define me. Um, and success is going to. So um, when I went into practice, I went into, initially I, I first clerked for a judge and then I worked um, as an associate in a firm as many people do, first in a smaller firm. It was a very small firm and it disbanded after two and a half years. And I went to a larger firm and then a much larger firm. I wound up in one of the hundred largest law firms in the country. Um, and just as I had worked hard um, to overcome challenges in my youth. Um, I did so in my brief writing and in my uh, litigation work. And I wound up writing probably the largest brief the firm had ever had and handling the largest case probably the firm had ever had and probably has had since it was $865 million, Hewlett Packard against SunGuard. And I was the attorney in charge of writing the brief when I gave four weeks notice and started my firm. The reason I started it was um, I was looking at, around at a profession that I felt grossly disenfranchised um, women and other people from historically underrepresented groups, including people of color, LGBTQI people, people with disabilities, et cetera. And I wasn't seeing that, there, that I was going to be treated equally at any other firm. I was looking at and thinking that the firms I, I wanted to be at, that it was kind of a systemic issue. So I founded my own firm. Um, and I thought I'd be lucky if I lasted six months. Um, but fortunately, that was in 2007. Um, you know, here we are in 2022, and um, I'm looking at you know, the next 10 years and where we're going from here. So um, my first client, and I'll end with that story, um, was a woman of color, an African-American woman who I had worked for at, the small, uh, at, at a, a smaller firm when I left Big Law, I went to a smaller firm also there. I, I just didn't see women being treated as equals. Um, in fact, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't going to be made partner and that was kind of made clear. Whereas a man that I thought um, didn't perform as well as I did was going to be named a partner. I wouldn't even get the title of um, partner, non-equity partner. So I founded my own firm. I thought I'd be lucky if I lasted six months and this woman who had um, been my client at the small firm um, became one of my first clients in my own firm. And I would send an invoice and it would boomerang right back to me with, with a check. So um, it's a little story of women supporting women, but that's how, that's how I started to, founded my own firm. Thank you for that, Cheryl. And I love your examples of how what you deem to be failures turn into successes and huge successes for you. So thank you very much for, for providing that to us. How about you, Afsar? How did you get to the position that you are in today? Um, I don't have such a great, you know, well thought out plan as Cheryl. I've kind of fallen into a variety of glorious accidents. So um, I really, I, and I will also, also say being general counsel of a private credit firm or being general counsel 
period was never my goal. Um, my goal was always to have a um, very challenging job that stretched me intellectually, work with colleagues that I respected and admired and wanted to spend time with, um, and uh, in a collegial and respectful environment. It was really more about the building blocks versus the specific title. Um, and I really did fall into this job. The, uh, uh, my prior employer was a shareholder and still is a Varagon. Varagon didn't have a, a lawyer in house, didn't have a general counsel. And the shareholder called up and said, we're on your board. Um, we think it would really help to you know, put the house in order to have a great lawyer. Um, here's a resume. Why don't you interview her? And so I was parachuted in. But I will say that when opportunities have come up, including Varagon, you know, why is it that I got the opportunities that I did? Um, and that really comes back to, I mean, always excellent work. That has got to be completely internal to you. It doesn't, if people around you are mediocre and are fine with mediocre work, you've got to be excellent. If people are backstabbing you and you hate their guts and you hate that, you have got to be excellent. If people, you know, just think you're the, the bee's knees and therefore you can get away with less good work, you have got to be excellent. It's a self-concept. It's a self-identity. You're answerable only to you and nobody else. So that should never be compromised. Um, you should, you have to, always deliver. People will remember over time those who deliver and those who they feel cannot be trusted. You know, um, you have to be accountable to Cheryl's point about, uh, you know, a, a big markup bringing a, a learning opportunity. If, if you, we all make mistakes. If you make a mistake, earn up, uh, own up to it, correct it, overcorrect it and move on. Um, you have to be very well prepared and anticipate for everything that you do. Um, and then finally, on the personal uh, side or, you know, person to person side, it, be extremely team oriented and respectful. This is not an I career. This is a we team effort. And I think that those building blocks kind of bring you to the forefront to people when there are opportunities available. Thank you, Asa. I think that's some great advice that we can all put into play. Um, how about you, Danielle? Hi, I just want to um, say how much I appreciate being invited to participate on this panel. I care deeply about um, women, supporting women, and I just think it's important to know that um, Afsvar and Cheryl and I met through another wonderful woman who is a champion for women and connected us. And so this is a testament to women coming together to support and share. Um, you know, I am the, so my firm's executive committee has five members. Uh, we have 175 lawyers. And for those who are at uh, firms, and I think many people are, at, the executive committee essentially runs the firm, right? They are managing the, the high level strategic decisions of a law firm. And it's not very typical to have um, a woman at the seat of the table. And I did not aspire to be in this role. Um, so I am uh, I started my practice in big law, went in-house for a little while, was a, an assistant United States attorney, and then came back to private practice. And what I can say as far as how opportunities have evolved for me from way back when to getting the seat at the executive committee is just how you treat people. Right, how you treat people matters. How you show up matters. Um, you know, to what Avi said about um, excellence in the law, um, being being caring about your career more than anybody else. No one cares about your career more than you, right? So you want to make sure, you know, whatever level you are, that when you're handing something in, it is your absolute best work, right? And we all have days where, like, maybe it's not. Well, then maybe you ask for an extra day, right? Because you people don't remember um, that you said yes people remember that you did a good job, right? So if you say yes to everybody because you're trying to be helpful and then you're not giving really good work product, then you're you're harming yourself. So, so one, it being incredibly excellent at your craft, but just being a good person, right? So I've been in my firm for about four years and got um, was told literally the night before I was on the slate to be voted, um, you know, among other, other members, um, uh, there were about six people on the slate and the equity partners, um, I'm an equity partner of my firm, voted for who should get this spot. And so I think it's a testament, you know, obviously I'm um, 
uh, someone who cares about her work based on what I've just told you. You have to be excellent. You have to work hard. You have to be a good person. But it's also how you treat people, right? And so the my partners trusted me to sit at this table and um, they take this responsibility really seriously. Thank you for that, Danielle. That's a really important role for you to have. And I think your firm's very lucky to have you on that role as well. Um, you know, as we heard through the introductions and, and what you ladies have said so far, you all have some very, you know, prestigious careers that have surely some great highlights to them. So I think it would be great if, um, without revealing confidential information, of course, if you can tell us about some of the biggest or most influential or prolific issues or cases that you've handled throughout the course of your career. Uh, we'll start with you, Afsar, on this one. Um, sure, happy to. So I know this is a litigation council uh, group. Uh, so what I say is probably going to be gibberish. But um, in 2020, I led a multi-billion dollar and multi-year transaction that closed that was equal parts M&A, merger and acquisition area, joint venture and fundraising. Um, I was the lead negotiator, legal negotiator for Varagon, but also the orchestra con uh, conductor for the entire transaction that involved four principals, so Varagon and three other counterparts, two investment banks, and five law firms. And I synchronized and coordinated the efforts of all of them to get to closing. So the M&A component consisted of us redeeming out our former shareholder and Aflac coming in to take a minority non-controlling stake in Varagon. The joint venture was now you had three different parties at the Varagon table. You had Aflac, our existing strategic partner, AIG, and Varagon. And so how do you come up with a tripartite governance and cooperation framework for an operating business um, on a go forward basis? So that was the joint venture. And then the fundraising component consisted of Aflac making a multi-billion, multi-year investment commitment to Varagon and AIG, our existing partner, re-upping and extending a multi-billion dollar commitment as well, all on new terms that had to be negotiated. Um, and then once we signed, of course, then we had to go and get buy-in from many other constituents. So vendors, um, credit, creditors, investors, most importantly. Um, so that's what I call fun. Thank you, Absar. That definitely sounds interesting and like a lot of work. <laughs> um, how about you, Danielle? So certainly, uh, not anywhere close to what uh, Afsar has done, it's like remarkable. But when I'm listening to her talk about her role in that transaction, I think the 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 matters that have meant the most to me are the ones where I had to stand on my own two feet. So when I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office and I was first chairing federal trials, like those those were the times where it. it was on me, right? I had a trial partner, I had a case agent, but at the end of the day, like this was my case and my presentation. And, and those are the stretch moments, right? Where you really don't know how to do it until you are doing it. And now in private practice, you know, I, I do um, a lot of internal investigations for really big companies and, and report into CEOs and board of directors. And, and every time I do something like that, it's, it's more, um, it's more confidence building, right? Like there, there are times where you're like, you know, and, I, and I'll just say it like, wow, I can't believe you are trusting me to help you guide you through these really hard decisions, right? But then I take a beat and I'm like, well, why not me, right? Like I've got all this behind me. Like I'm, I'm absolutely the person who can help you through this, right? And so I would say as far as like, you know, if you ask for like one issue or one matter that I worked on, I don't think I could say, but it's more like the the spaces that I'm in, right? When I'm presenting to the board of directors, like that's a, a time where I feel like, okay, I'm stretching and I'm getting better and I'm honing my craft and certainly um, trying federal cases for the government um, that nothing like it. Thank you, Danielle. And I don't know, you know, how much you can or cannot get into, but is there one specific case, you know, at the U.S. Attorney's Office that sticks out to you as maybe, you know, one of the favorite ones you worked on or the one that was maybe most impactful on you or? 
Yeah, so I definitely can. So I, I sat in the health care and government fraud unit and I did, you know, a lot of uh, white collar prosecution. Um, but I also, when I was uh, early days, the attorney's office um, did, uh, you know, some human trafficking and um, some child uh, exploitation cases. And one of the last cases I did, um, I second seated it uh, for another attorney who was, it was her case. And I helped her kind of guide her through um, prosecuting this case. Um, it was a case where uh, the defendant was um, alleged to have uh, caused three young girls to produce child pornography, um, and they were socially isolated, uh, physically isolated, uh, and um, they never actually, he never actually, you know, was in the same room as them, but through means of the internet got them to produce images of themselves that, um, you know, were really uh, traumatic for them. and. That defendant, uh, you know, wouldn't take a, a plea and we ended up going to trial and that trial was probably the one that I remember the most, um, prepping those young women, putting them on the stand. And one of them, she she actually, um, she had, she, she passed out in the middle of, of testifying, right? Um, and when that jury came back and the poor person uh, looked at me when she said, you know, guilty, and there were a number of counts, um, that was the one where I, you know, in all other cases you care about it, that one I actually like having met these girls and seen what happened to them, like, you know, tears came in my eyes and I'm like, do not cry, do not cry. Right. But it was, um, it was really impactful. So that's the one that sticks with me the most. Thank you so much for sharing that, Danielle. That's definitely very, very admirable work and just so, so important. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. How about you, Cheryl? What are some of the highlights of, of your career so far? Um, well, I'll name a, a couple of cases. Um, and, and like Danielle, I've not done a, a billion dollar, let alone multi-billion dollar matter. Um, and um, like AFSAR, I haven't done uh, the kind of work that Danielle has um, involving you know, people's liberty, right? And, um, and crimes that have been, um, you know, horrific things that have been done to other people like that. Um, so in commercial litigation, one of the things I'm actually working on now is very exciting. Um, it's a hundred million dollar claim. Um, it's in the aviation industry. Um, and it involves a claim for a breach of contract by one company in the airline industry against another um, for services that our client claims should have been done. Um, and so, you know, it's obviously a very, very large matter. Um, we also handled a case that was reported in, and, and that case where at the, at the beginning of, we handled a case that was reported in Law 360. It was a $199.5 million claim. Um, it involved a claim against various insurers. We represented one of the insurers um, for a external heart monitoring device. And the claim was um, that our client and these other insurance companies should have provided um, coverage for this uh, device. And we actually won summary judgment on two of the three grounds that we brought. And then it went up on appeal, that was reversed. We went back to the trial court. We won on the third uh, reason that we uh, sought. So it was a motion to dismiss that we had brought. We got the trial court to decide on the third ground and we won that and that went um, up on appeal and we won again. So we ultimately got summary judgment um, on all of it. Uh, last, I would say in terms of like the really kind of interpersonal things, they've also been very impactful. So in the employment space where we represent companies that um, are uh, sued for claims of alleged discrimination, for instance, Family Medical Leave Act, alleged violations, um, sexual harassment, these kinds of things. Um, you know, those are very personal claims and they're not just personal to the plaintiff, they're personal to the employer who thinks that they haven't done anything wrong. Um, or they have one rogue employee, but they've got great policies and procedures. So um, we've handled a number of those cases and you know, they're very personal and you really get to know your client. I mean, I got to know that like one of the superiors, we talked about 
um, you know, her issues with trying to um, adopt a child. And I talked about, you know, how I went through four rounds of fertility before I was able to have my daughter. And so, I mean, there's just so much where you really get to know the people. Um, and then of course the trials that I've had, including one case where um, it took 10 years to get to trial. Um, so those are the things that stick out to me the most. Thank you for that, Shell. I think that was a great description of the variety of, of practice areas that you've been involved in. Um, shifting gears a little bit, you know, since 2016, there have been more women in law school than men. Um, however, you know, the, the legal profession still remains pretty much a male dominated profession. Um, I mean, I know me personally, I can't even count how many times I've shown up to take or defend a deposition and been asked if I was the court reporter. And I know that that does not happen to my male counterparts. So um, I would just be really interested to hear um, if you ladies would mind sharing any stories or experiences you have of unique challenges that you faced in the legal profession as women in particular and how you handled them. And then, you know, along those lines, what advice would you give to other women lawyers uh, to overcome such obstacles? Let's start with you, Danielle, on this one. Well, it's just harder being a woman in the law. <laughs> Let's just frame it, it just is. Um, you know, I heard a quote once that said, there'll be parity when the average man is treated the same as the average woman. And I think women need to be 10 times better to have you know opportunities and and that's been that's been my experience as a woman who um have done well or are not just good at their job they're phenomenal at their job so um you know coming up i came up in in big law and um you know have been in house and been at the government and i think that the the piece that's been consistent is that my my biggest superpower is that people are underestimating me like it happens all the time. There's an under, they just underestimate, you know, who they're talking to. There's a sense of, you know, maybe when I'm, you know, doing an investigation, someone doesn't treat me um, as seriously as maybe they would if, you know, there was someone maybe a little bit older or someone who might have, you know, be a man. Um, but that actually is something that benefits me, right? And so I would say, rather than get frustrated and upset about that, and believe me, I, I did when I was much junior, I took it very personally, and I wanted to prove and establish that I, you know, was just as good as, you know, whoever was sitting next to me. But I've come to realize that it's actually, it's actually very, very beneficial to my work, to my clients. Um, and so I embrace that. I think that the, the biggest piece for me that has shifted as I've evolved in my career is, is calling things out when I see them, right? So if something does happen, I don't um, ignore it. I'll say, you know, that was really inappropriate, right? Simple, like just, it's a fact. That was really inappropriate. Um, or, you know, I remember once being a very junior lawyer and um, having done all of the work on this one presentation. Um, and there was a partner from another law firm um, not my current firm, a partner at another law firm who came to this meeting and I was handing out the, the, the presentation and this partner from this other law firm, another big law firm, just assumed that I was someone's admin and like winked at me. And, and I, I remember being like a second year associate, like, did that just happen? Like, and sitting down and saying to the partner that that I work for, and, and I've, I've been very fortunate in that the mentors I've had have been women and men, and that male partner didn't notice it, right? And so it's like calling things out so that people can, like, hey, this just happened. Like, did you notice that? And then he said something to, to that other guy, you know, after the fact, but didn't know, right? Because it wasn't something he was considering. Um, I mean, I could, I have a lot that I could talk about, but I'll just pause and if the, the conversation continues, I'll circle back. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, Danielle. And I think that, you know, you really hit on something when you talked about how um, the male uh, partner that you were with really had no idea that that even happened. And I think that, you know, that's so prevalent. A lot of times you see something happen to a, a woman attorney and, and the male attorneys around <laughs> have no idea that that's even going on. I remember one time when I was, you know, mistaken for the court reporter, I facetiously said to the 
a male attorney who was next to me, oh, I bet this happens to you all the time, right? And he was like, oh, no, 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 I don't think it ever happened. And I said, I know it never happened to you, but do you see how it happens here? So I think, you know, your advice to really call it out and let, you know, the, the male attorney see that as well is, is really great advice. Um, how about you, Cheryl? Um, yes, I think Danielle's 100% right that women are treated differently and um, worse. We're treated worse and that we do have to perform better. And actually the data shows it. We have to uh, perform twice as well. Um, and that's why you see half as many women um, as should be made partner are, half as many people of color should be made partner are. It's a systemic problem. Um, so I faced it in a multitude of ways in the legal profession and uh, give you a couple of stories. Um, first, when I went to a document review, I mean, literally where you get the letter that instead of us producing our documents, you can come to our office and review them here, get and, you know, sticky note, whatever you want copied. I came at the um, scheduled time. I was put in the room where the documents were. I was literally just reviewing documents and sticky noting documents. And that was it. I wasn't talking to anyone. And the next thing I know, I mean, it's a very bizarre story, but the next thing I know, somebody like over six foot tall comes in the room, screams at me, gets so close to me. I'm literally scared he's going to hurt me. I remember putting my hands under the table and gripping it for dear life. And then he turns around and leaves. I can't even to this day remember what he looks like or what he said. I was so scared. Um, and then I remember later, it was like 25 minutes later, he was so calm and he came back in the room and he said something again, I don't even remember what, and he leaved and he quietly shut the door. So that was my first experience with, you know, being bullied. Um, I had another experience where um, I was being bullied in a multi-party case. There were five lawyers on my side, the defense side and one plaintiff's count, actually two plaintiff's counsel. One of the two was bullying relentlessly. At the time I was a lawyer, so he was bullying me first, constantly using language about how inexperienced I was, and also about, you know, you young lady, young lady this and young lady that, and, and you know, um, always just being very mean. Um, and I pleaded with my co-counsel, would you please speak up for me? It will stop if just any of you would speak up for me and not just make it only me doing this. And none of them did. It, at the very end of the case, I got a recording on my phone from one of them apologizing for having never spoken up for me. And I was fortunate that at the time, my recordings on my voicemail went to my email and they would come up as a MP3. Um, and I actually sent it to all counsel. And I said, um, you know, at least he, he apologized. I, I said, I think it's very late and I wish it had been done sooner. And when you see your wives and your daughters and your sisters get bullied, please know it's not just the bully that's the cause of the problem. It's all these other people not speaking up and not um, stepping in. Um, two more stories. One is that um, I was in a deposition once and literally there are like six to eight people around the desk. Again, all these other defense lawyers and myself. And it was a very large case. It was an alleged electrocution case. Two men had died. One other was very badly burned. I mean, he had like 95% of his skin. Was, it was just horrible. Um, and I was eviscerating the plaintiff's case, which was, was obviously a very valuable case. And the plaintiff's lawyer came around and was screaming and pointing his finger, like literally within an inch of my nose. And so I'm looking at the men. I'm one of eight kids. I have six brothers. I'm, I, I'm in shock that nobody is getting up to help me. And so I just started talking and saying on the record, opposing counsel is yelling, he's screaming, he's very close to me, he's come across the table, his, his, no, his finger is an inch from my nose and I'm scared he's gonna hit me. And that's when he realized, I mean, his whole face changed and he stepped back and he went back to his seat. Um, and it's awful that we have to deal with this thing. Last story is that um, in a case with a judge, in front of a judge, Two times we had conferences and both times he let my male opposing counsel go on and on and on and on. And every time I tried to even speak about my case, he just said, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. So I was literally barred from speaking for two hearings. And on the third one, I told the judge, your honor, 
we have to either go on the record and do this on the record or you have to enter an order that bars me from appearing so I can appeal what you're doing here. And I actually tried a case in front of him and won, but I mean, it's, it's terrible to be put in the position, but I, you know, you have no choice if the judge isn't going to let you speak. And I won the case and it wound up in Pennsylvania jury verdict review and analysis, I should add that. So, and that judge is no longer alive, unfortunately. Well, thank you for sharing that, Cheryl. I think that's really important to share that. You know, this doesn't only happen from, you know, our co-counsel, but it can also unfortunately happen in the situation like you with the, the court. And I think, you know, what you and Danielle shared is very important about, you know, the importance of male allyship. And I think it's, you know, just the contrast, seeing the contrast of how when Danielle, you know, brought that issue to her male partner, he uh, stuck up for her, whereas you, Cheryl, you were begging your co-counsel to, um, you know, stick up for you in those situations, and they wouldn't, and, and then one apologized, but it was kind of like, you know, too little, too late if you're not going to actually stick up for it, so I think it's really important for, you know, men to be aware of this and to be able to really try to help be part of the solution and to advance women in the profession as well. Um, so thank you both so much for sharing that. Um, how about you, Absar? Well, now I'm feeling like I've had a very lucky career <laughs> because I don't have the horror stories or maybe I'm just too clueless and they bounce off me. But um, I, I don't know that I've been treated poorly specifically because I'm a woman, but I have definitely been treated poorly um, with condescension, with disrespect. Um, and I also, you know, in a more nuanced way, I have been in environments where I come in, you know, it's a whole, it's a sea of shirts, it's men, and there's just me or maybe one other woman. It's Monday morning, everyone's talking about football. And, you know, that's not necessarily because I'm a woman, but I'm an Iranian who grew up in Europe, who came, I don't own a TV, I don't even know the rules of the bloody game, I don't want, I don't care to learn the bloody rules, you know. And so, so, you know, there could be environments that could make me question, you know, do I belong here? You know, am I part of the team? Um, so to the first on condescending people or disrespectful people, I would say, you know, no one other than you has, can make you feel small and can make you feel inferior. And that's not said in a lack of empathy. That is the most empathetic empathic thing that I could possibly say, which is that's a reflection on them. I mean, I come, I come to the table with a stranger feeling like we're equal. The minute they're inappropriate, they are inferior, you know? So whatever it takes for you to have a very good, strong sense of self, if it's therapy, get therapy. If it's, you know, wonderful family, have wonderful family, whatever it is, because when you value yourself, you will in, in whatever that circumstance is or difficult person is, you will respond in a way to protect yourself. Like Cheryl did with, you know, speaking for the record. Um, so, um, you know, have your allies and, and do whatever it takes to cultivate your own sense of self-worth. Um, on cultural pockets, I would say, you know, ask, is this deliberately exclusionary? Is there an intent here? Um, in my case, it has turned out that there hasn't been, you know, those same people that on Monday morning, you know, sat there talking about football are the same people that today when a deal closes, and I just did this a month ago, we had an enormous deal that closed that I led, you know, and we're in the pantry celebrating, and I show up having put on a ball gown and bling and high heels, and, you know, just gestured to all the men and said, you know, what, what is going on here? There's a lot of champagne. Somebody pour, you know, pour the lady a drink. You know, they're the ones who fall over themselves to pour me the drink. And you... I think in a situation like that, you make space. You let your own character be known. You know, as, as you can see in my background, I have flowers, I have fish, I have, you know, little eggs. Uh, my male counterparts do not have that in their office, you know, but they love it. It becomes an exchange of education and who I am and who you are. I advertise being Iranian around Nowruz, which is, you know, the best possible day in the year ever which is the spring equinox and the moment the entire earth and all of us all are reborn, I'm not available. It's the Iranian new year. And the entire firm celebrates it by the way, because I advertise it. And you know, this year 
once a week we have uh, the firm brings lunch in for the whole firm to you know eat um around no Ruz, it was iranian food you know and everybody got excited about that so i think you know make space for yourself and others coming up through the ranks and people around you that the guys around me are wonderful about it all you kind of make space for them too and allow them to be allies and be encouraging so if you are sadly in a place that is being deliberately exclusionary i think that's when you know you take action you report it you can report it to hr i know someone who is an md at a, at a very large asset manager who reported a story to me a year or two ago they'd had an outing for their group um, but it was semi-personal semi-firm and the host had invited everybody in the group other than her and she was the only woman so she found out about it she reported it to hr hr said uh you know contacted the host and said this is cancelled you know when you learn to be a team player and when you learn to invite the whole team then you can have your party you know um so if it's bad enough leave there are other places that will treat you better you know as cheryl pointed out not you know she started her own firm but whatever the options are but i do think there's an enormous amount of benign but but silent space that then you can help to define to include you and bring others in thank you for that Afsa. i think that's some really great advice and i love your advice to you know embrace who you are. Um, I think that that's really important. I know I shared this with you ladies, but 10 years into my career and I finally feel comfortable wearing a pink blazer because I can, you know, express my style as a woman and not feel that I have to, you know, be into this certain box of what an attorney is expected to be from, you know, a man's point of view. So I love your examples of how you embrace who you are, your cultural differences, your differences as a woman to, you know, really set up who you are in your space. I think that's a great example. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of us here today that aspire to have the types of careers that you ladies all have. So, you know, I think we'd love to hear what advice would you have to women who, you know, want to uh, obtain a certain career goal, whether it be, you know, for them to become a general counsel one day, be on their firm's executive committee, start their own law firm or any other, you know, career, whether it be a, a judge or, you know, a law school professor or leadership in the public interest sector, maybe not even, you know, a legal career at all. But what advice would you have for mid-level women in the profession to really distinguish themselves to be able to rise? Um, and let's start with you, Cheryl, on this one. Um, so one thing that Afsar and Danielle mentioned, be excellent. Completely agree. Let's start with that. Be excellent. Um, going back to my story about the paper that was written everywhere with red ink. And um, when I bombed the first time I tried to get on the moot court team, those two experiences actually were fundamental to my success in the profession because I learned through them, number one, how to write, and number two, how to present an oral argument. Um, so learn from your mistakes and also just learn from feedback. I don't even think of it as mistakes anymore. I really think of it as feedback, learning experiences. Um, so those, those were ginormous helps in my career. Um, find what you love. So I knew I wanted to be a litigator. I you know, am excited to get to speak at this event. I am excited to get in front of an audience. I knew that litigation was for me. Um, find what you love. Um, my other passion is for diversity, equity, and inclusion, as Jamie mentioned when she talked about my background. Um, so I'm, I mentioned one of eight kids. I've got two slow learning brothers. I'm Jewish and I'm a woman. So I see diversity through multiple lenses and it's a core value of mine. Um, as Danielle was mentioning about like helping women in the profession, um, so important, helping women and others from historically disenfranchised groups. And it's actually helped me rise a ton because all the work I do in the various organizations that you mentioned, Jamie, um, I've built incredible contacts through them. So while I thought I would be lucky if this law firm I started in 20, 2007 lasted for six months, it's around today because of all the relationships I've built. So one thing I would definitely say, um, and Afsar mentioned it about allies, 
build a coalition of allies, spend time outside of your own desk, meeting people, whether, you know, if it's, not safe environment that you can be in physically, be in online, but getting to know people um, and building relationships. That's how I built my whole client base is literally mostly from all the DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion work that, that I've done in my career in the various organizations I've been involved in. NAMWOLF, as you mentioned, the National Association of Minority and Women Owned Law Firms. I've been active in the American Bar Association active in the Pennsylvania Bar Association, active in the Philadelphia Bar Association, active in the Temple Law Alumni Association. And in each, when I say active, I don't just show up. Like I volunteer for things and that's how you rise. That's how I became the president of the Temple Law Alumni Association and on the executive committee of the Pennsylvania Bar and on the um, Chancellor's Diversity Advisory Panel in the Philadelphia Bar and in the American Bar Association. I had built relationships with people who have national um, profiles. And so I met, for instance, Bobby Liebenberg, who most women in the profession are going to know that name because she's such a superstar champion in the profession. And she's the one who said, um, I will, you know, put my neck out and sponsor you for the gender equity task force um, that was by the appointment of the president of the ABA only. Um, Danielle mentioned, uh, without saying her name, Karen Pollack, who had introduced the three of us. It's, you know, building um, those relationships that, that uh, Danielle was talking about um, that are so fundamental. Um, I'll just give a couple of tips to place, echo, and promote. You want to build a coalition of allies. These are really good tools to use. Um, place, echo, promote. Place somebody, meaning like um, for this event, I invited uh, the other speakers to come to this event. So I'm placing them here, right? You can recommend people um, and say, you're such a good writer. I think you should write in as I've asked you to do and you've gotten published, Jamie. Write in to the American Bar Association. We'll do a special round table and you can write articles in a series and we can do a literal uh, round table like this on it. That's placement, echoing. When somebody does something really neat in a group, give them the credit for it. So say for instance, um, Afsar, let's say as a junior lawyer and I say, you know, that was a really good comment Afsar made. I agree with her, we should, whatever Afsar said, um, we should work on our bias training and make sure that we treat everybody as equals. That really helps um, a woman, uh, a foreign born woman to rise in the profession, um, that kind of thing. Um, place echo and then promote. You can promote somebody to partner if you're in a position like Danielle. Um, you can promote women, you can promote uh, others from historically disenfranchised groups, but you can also promote them if you're not in a position like Danielle or Afsar. You can literally like say things like, um, she would be a great person to make partner. She's an amazing lawyer, things like that. Um, so those are really good tools. And last, I'll just say, be authentic. Be you. Um, don't like, you, we can all watch a TV and see great trial lawyers and that kind of thing, but just be yourself because if you really want to build a relationship, let people get to know you. And then they're going to, you know, there's going to be a slice of people that really like you and they're going to want to see you succeed. Um, and that'll be super helpful to you in your career. So just be yourself. You don't have to put on any kind of act or be like anybody that you've ever seen on television. Thank you, Cheryl. I think that's really practical advice that everyone can take into consideration. And, you know, I, I agree with you that I think sometimes we see, I know myself as a litigator, I see, you know, these people on you know TV or then you think this is what a lawyer is supposed to be, but I think you do so much better work and you're so much more effective when you actually are authentic to yourself um, in doing what you need to do. So thank you for that advice. Um, let's move on to you, Danielle. What would your advice be for mid-level women looking to rise in the profession? So we've all touched on it, community, right? Having you know your board of directors inside your organization and outside of your organization. Um, part of, you know, the doors that have been opened to me have been um, because I was, you know, out and about in the right organization at the right time. So getting active in bar associations, getting active in, you know, whatever it is you care about, just being actually present and being a part of it. It doesn't have to be the law. You just have to be, um, you just have to be participatory, you know, and, and, and let people get to know who you are. My advice would be, you know, for that mid-level uh, role, you know, you've worked really, really hard to get to where you are. Um, you're incredibly valuable to the organizations you're in, right? You're in that sweet spot where you, you know what you're doing. Um, you're able to put in the time and the work. 
you know, you have to just trust your intuition, right? And so that means, um, you know, we talked about this in the prep, like a, th- a tip, actually Karen Pollock, again, she taught me this tip years ago. I was a first year associate. Um, she told me, you know, sometimes you're you're in a meeting and maybe you don't feel confident saying something, right? Maybe you're like, oh, I'm too junior or, you know, I don't know if I should say this in front of the client if you're in a firm. Um, and she told me, you know, sometimes when you're in this meeting and you're not sure, just next time, every, every time somebody says something that either A, you thought of or B, was dumb, do a click, right? Like just like very quietly, like the ticks on your paper. And once you get to five, start talking, right? And so, you know, whatever you need to do to feel confident um, and to put yourself, uh, you know, so people get to see what you're capable of because it's not enough to put your head down and do a good job. No one is going to say, oh, wow, that was wonderful. The people who are rising are the ones who have access or the ones who have the ability to be in front of decision makers. The one who, you know, showed up to, you know, that historical like, oh, they went golfing or, oh, they went for cigars or they did whatever. Right. You know, sometimes as women, you're not invited to those rooms. So I make a big point to set up lunches, set up dinners, putting people in front of stakeholders and decision makers. So I would say, you know, if there's someone in your organization you want to get to know and you want to emulate, go meet that person. Like put yourself out there. Hey, I'd love to, you know, and and don't say I want to pick your brain because that nobody wants to do that. Right. Like say something like, I noticed you wrote an article on X. I was inspired by Y. Would, you know, would you be willing to have a cup of coffee? Right. Like it, it, be genuine in your, to what Charles is saying, being genuine in your, um, your outreach, but truly, truly, truly the most important thing that I can, can impress on everyone is to just always be generous with your network, be helpful to other people, do not be competitive, be competitive with yourself. I'm, I'm really ambitious and I'm competitive with myself, but I don't care what you're doing, right? Cause your success has nothing to do with mine. So just just keep your head in the game and that you you have to be helpful. That's it's like the universal law. So the more you are helpful to other people, the more doors open. And if you are in a position to, you know, in a, as a mid-level, maybe you think that you're not in a position to influence somebody else's career, or help somebody else, but you are right. Like bring them to the meeting, tell the senior partner how great so-and-so is, you know, all the things Cheryl said. So, um, and just trusting your intuition. That's a big one. Thank you, Danielle. That's great advice. And I think I told you this when we discussed it previously, but I'm definitely going to use your thing with the ticks in the meeting, because I think that that's such, such a great, you know, confidence booster as well for, you know, women who may be a little bit like myself tend to run a little bit more, you know, introverted. So to be able to really make sure, you know, that I put myself out there and speak when I should be. Um, and I think, you know, your advice about how to make those initial introductions with people to kind of grow your network was really great as well. So thank you so much for that. How about you, Afsar? So um, Cheryl and Daniel have said so much. I agree 100% with everything that they've said, so I will have less to add. <laughs> so I'm going to go in a little bit of a different direction um, to add on to it. Um, embrace your aggression. You know, I and I, I don't mean that that needs kind of a little bit more of an explanation than we have time for. I don't mean become a jerk, but I think if you look at men and women, women are disadvantaged by having been conditioned, you know, socially, familiarly, whatever it is, into thinking that a level of aggression is, you know, unseemly or, you know, is is not appropriate. And it's such a wonderful tool. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll have, we, we were looking to close a deal and we had these daily morning calls with, you know, 10 people on them because the whole team in at Varagon and outside council and others as well. And every once in a while to wrap up the call, which I was leading every morning, I would say, all right, everybody, let's go out there and slit some throats. You know, it's just sort of like, you know, and that meant do a good job, but you know, I think it can be a very, very valuable tool and you have to be careful and use it in the right places, but it is a quality, not a defect. That's number one. Um, I set very clear boundaries and respect other people's boundaries. So, you know, if something is my call, ain't nobody going near it. And I, you know, I just had this yesterday, somebody within the group didn't mean to be, you know, inappropriate or anything, but just sent an email saying, let's change this agreement. Immediate, immediate email back from me. 
No changes to any agreements without my approval. Let's discuss, please. Right. And everybody fell in line and it was great, you know, but also if it's not my area, it's not my call. I have to respect and defer to other people and work with them and ultimately, you know, defer. And I think, you know, we're all children and any of you who have children or have been children in the past, you know, <laughs> we need we need boundaries, we need rules, we need to know where we stand, it gives clarity and it allows, you know, like peace of mind. Um, I think the other thing really is love what you do. Joy is infectious. People want to be around you. Counterparties want to negotiate with you. They will concede a point because they like you. You know, um, I have had that before. And also when you love what you do, you're really gonna give it your best. And so you will deliver your best product. And by loving what you do, I don't mean, you know, if you like sculpture or painting, abandon the law. I mean, you, when I first started doing fund formation work, it's not like I thought, oh, this is my passion, you know, but the more you give to something, the more you will love it because the more, as you gain mastery, it will become satisfying. So if you're at the start of your career, have the patience. If we're talking about mid, you know, mid career people, you already know what that means. And, and if you don't love it, and if it's a struggle, you shouldn't be doing it ultimately. Find something you know, that may be a minor pivot, it may be a major pivot, you, you, should, you should love what you do. And I think that goes a long way with yourself and people around you. So uh, I will stop there. Yeah, I actually want to add to what Afi said, because you, you, you brought something that I learned early and I use to this day, is that if you have a conflict on to boundaries, if you have a conflict, you don't need to explain what your conflict is, right? So you don't have to say, I have a, a work call. You don't have to say, I have to pick up the kids. You don't have to say, I'm getting a manicure. It's all a conflict. So I have a conflict. And, and nobody needs to know the reason why. And I think, you know, when you talk about setting boundaries and doing things that really you know, are important to you in addition to the work, right? I mean, work-life balance is, I'm sure we're going to get to this at some point, but like it, it, you just have to make time for yourself in ways that you're able to sustain all the other responsibilities. And so, you know, my favorite thing to do is to say, I have a conflict. And sometimes that's this, I have a conflict. Sometimes it's, I'm picking up my kids and sometimes I'm at the nail salon. So it's all a conflict. Absolutely. And Danielle, you kind of read, read my mind of where we were going to go next with respect to work-life balance. Um, and thank you for that advice as well, Absar. That was really great advice. I, I especially loved, you know, when you're talking about being aggressive, because I think that that's so important because as women, you know, a lot of times we, people do tend to talk over us and people do tend to, you know, try to take over things sometimes that we can't handle. And I think that that's really good advice to make sure that you really stay firm in what your responsibilities are and, and what you you know that you can do. Um, before we move on to our work-life balance topic, I just wanted to remind the um, attendees that if you have any questions at all for our panelists, please put them in the question and answer um, portion of the, the Zoom. We will have time to get to questions at the end, so please, if you have any, um, feel free to put them in there. Uh, so yes, going on to where we were talking about work-life balance or, you know, work-life integration, you know, as women um, in particular, I think, you know, we have a lot of competing priorities, whether they be personal, professional, um, taking care of yourself. I think as women, we tend to be caretakers a lot for the people around us. So I would love to get, um, you know, some of your tips for um, balancing all the competing responsibilities that you have in your life, both personal and professional, while also having time for your um, self and, and for your self-care and your other hobbies and interests. So why don't we start with you on that, Danielle? I know um, you touched on that a little bit, but I'd love to have you expand upon that a little bit more. Sure. I think it comes down to uh, making yourself a priority, right? So, and it's also, be, it's also the season of your career, right? So when you first start out, it's a lot harder to say, you know, I need to prioritize my self-care when you are, you know, asked to do X amount of hours and you've got multiple people, you know, pulling on your demands, but that doesn't mean that you can't, right? So I, I'm not trying to be like Pollyanna about it, that it's easy. It's not. And particularly as you get, you get more senior, you have more responsibilities and whatever your, you know, life circumstances are, you know, your friends, your family, your children, whatever they are, like, 
there, there are competing demands. And so I would just say that what I have found for me is I put myself on literally on the top of the to-do list. I have a, a planner that bakes in self-care. And so it doesn't mean that like every day I'm doing something really fun or glamorous or anything like that, but it just means that, you know, in the morning I wake up a half hour early so I can have coffee by myself and I can, you know, read because I enjoy to read, right? Like, so I like, you know, to have that time. And if I don't wake up early to do it, then I don't do it. Or if there's, you know, uh, a friend that I really enjoy, right? Like making time for those friendships are important, right? It's so easy to give up on like, you know, you know, you talk about work-life balance. There's a lot of focus on, you know, your, your work and your family, but like your friendships are really important and they help sustain you. And, you know, we talked about a little bit, but a lot of my success in every, every area that I've been is because I've had really great work friends, like, that have become like my best friends. So sustaining your friendships is really important. Um, and just making it non-negotiable and and not and not being apologetic about it, right? Like, you know, no one needs to know why you're doing something, right? Obviously you're gonna blow up a deadline, but if you need to, you know, pick up your kids, just block your calendar, go do it, and then log back on, right? Be a be a professional. Absolutely. I think that's some great advice that we can definitely all put into play. Um, how about you, Afsar? So I think just building on what Danielle said, I think you need to be mindful and understand any choice you make should be intentional and it should be understanding the costs and the benefits. Um, in my first few years, I had zero balance. I, I was working 100 hour weeks. I was doing triple all nighters. I mean, I would go in at Monday morning and I would leave the office on Thursday. So um, depending, I mean, I still occasionally made time for oil painting at four in the morning, but that was at, you know, at the cost of, you know, instead of sleeping five hours, I would sleep, you know, three hours because I made time for the oil painting. So I really didn't have balance. In, and I think in the way the question was framed and that was okay because I got extraordinary legal training that I really wanted um, on an accelerated basis. And then I left the big law and went to a spectacular you know, employer where I was running multi-billion dollar deals by myself, you know, and, and that's when balance kicked in. Um, so if you could t take that choice or you could say, you know, I want, fewer hours, you know, time with my kids and all that. And then you should also be at peace with what you don't get in other contexts. So as long as it's intentional, I think that's an important thing. And then you're at peace. I think um, sort of building on what Danielle was saying that she puts number one, at least a little bit of self-care every day, listen to yourself. You know, there are times when your inner self is screaming for something. You know, it may be sleep, it may be quiet time with not even your kids around, not even your significant other around. When you get, I know when I hit a point where I'm cranky, like there's a part of me internally that is screaming or is going to scream. As I see that approaching, I don't care who needs what. You know, my phone goes off the hook. I have an entire day. Nobody can reach me and nobody can reach me you know, and then I do what I want. Um, and I also think, um, give yourself grace. You know, there, there are things that, if I remember my, uh, one of my best friends when she had two small children, she said, you know what, guess what? More important to be a great mom. So if the laundry doesn't get done and the living room is messy, it is what it is, you know, that that's going to have to do, right? So there are things, in my case, there can be, you know, a couple of months I don't make it to the gym because, I prefer to sleep or be with my friends or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so instead of being self-critical or feeling guilty, which in my first few years as a lawyer, I would, you know, get now it's just good for me, you know, great, great for me that I can prioritize the wonderful things that I want in my life, <laughs> the gym be danced, you know? And so it's kind of learning that juggling and what is important and what you can let go of. And as Danielle was saying, it, you can go in and out. There are times when you're okay not having balance. There are times when you must have balance. And that can be when you're at the very start of your career, middle of your, you know, it, it really depends on your own walk. 
Thank you so much for that, Afsar. And I think I know you hit on this a little bit, and I know we talked about this in the prep, but you know, as women, we tend to be really hard on ourselves and feel guilty if we can't make all those different priorities that we have set for ourselves. So I love your advice to really, you know, if you can't get to the gym one day, don't beat yourself up. Or if there's something else that has to take priority one day, you know, don't let it get you down because there are, again, only so many hours in a day and we have, you know, different days we're going to have different priorities. So I think, you know, like you said, being easier on yourself and not feeling guilty or beating yourself up for not maybe getting to everything on your list in one day is okay. So that's great advice. Thank you very much. Um, and how about you, Cheryl? Um, so a lot of the things that they said, I'm going to touch on in what I say. So um, the point that Afsar just made about that there can be crunches, right? Crunch times and then times where you don't have as much work and then you do and then you don't. And it's not necessarily um, you know, a straight line across is very much the case in my career. As Danielle said, when you first start out and Afsar talked about it, you know, you might have to put a ton of time in like Afsar did where, you know, she had like uh, accelerated uh, period of time where she was working very, very hard. Um, I certainly had that it, actually in my clerkship, believe it or not, the first thing I did was clerk and most of the clerks that I was with were leaving their clerkships at four and five at the afternoon. And I was clerking for the calendar judge who heard, um, she decided a thousand motions um, a month. And I was the one giving the recommendations on how she should decide these thousand motions a month. So I had a lot of work to do. Um, and it made me, like, like Afsar was talking about, it was an accelerated training program and it, it made me so efficient. I mean, I could get through the thousand motions a month First, I was at 11, then 10 o'clock at night, then nine, eight. And by the end of my clerkship, the last couple of months, I was out at six o'clock. I was done them all. And I was writing her honors, uh, the drafts of her honors opinions. So um, it was great training, but things do change over time. Um, when I um, was at a large firm, I mentioned, um, I probably handled the largest case the firm had ever had and probably has had since, $865 million Hewlett Packard, that, that case against Sungard. Um, you know, I had worked on bigger and bigger and bigger briefs to get to that point. At some times, the first, at some points along the way, and it included the first brief I worked at at that firm, the first brief I got, the um, associate who had been assigned the brief, I, I can't even imagine doing this, sat on the brief, didn't do a thing, sat on a brief, post-trial motion brief, and then gave notice. And then there was literally like seven days left and our brief was due. And we got a one week extension. So I had two weeks to write a 30 day brief. Um, and so I was spending day and night and day and night and day and night getting it done. But when I finished, I mean, to these ladies points about excellence um, that you've got to give it you know, your best and you've got to make it great. Um, the partner who I did the work for, he was like this big booming trial lawyer, went around telling everybody you know, what a great job I had done. And that really set my career afloat. Um, and had me getting bigger and bigger and bigger cases and working on the larger and larger and more important briefs along the way. Um, so there were times that were crunch times where I was barely sleeping, you know, for instance, during that first brief writing session for two weeks. Um, and then I had a case um, where, and this is very unusual and I hope to never happen, have it happen again, but I was working for two years endlessly, just endlessly and that just, um, you know, that, that has made me kind of um, reset. And so where Danielle talked about like blocking time and you've got a conflict and that's that. So um, I now block time, like there's a certain time you, nobody reaches me, clients, nobody. And, I, and I, they know I won't schedule a meeting. My firm knows I won't schedule a meeting when I'm dropping off my daughter, when I'm picking up my daughter. They don't need to know that that's what I'm doing, but that's what I'm doing, you know, in the morning. I'm, I'm dropping off my daughter to preschool and picking her up not gonna be doing other things. Between the time I pick her up from preschool to the time she goes to bed is off limits. That's my time with her. You know, um, I'm an older mother. I, like I said, took me four tries to have her. She's a big priority in my life. Um, and then I have other priorities that I built in. So like, I love to play pickleball. I just started playing pickleball and I'm like completely already addicted to it. So I'm building in pickleball into my schedule um, and blocking off time where, where I can't make it. And the other thing I've, you know, obviously I think it's come across from my, my comments that I really care about and gives me positive energy is DE&I, diversity, equity, and inclusion work. So stuff like this, I built into, into my schedule, writing articles, doing speaking engagements, 
and um, you know, trying to move the needle in a positive direction. Um, one thing I didn't mention about my diversity is uh, my ex-husband is Latino and my, he's from Mexico. My daughter is a little Latina. And you know, there's, um, that's another uh, way in which I see diversity through multiple lenses and really wanna try to make a, leave a better world. Um, you know, Afsar talked about um, paving the way you know, with all the things she does in her office that are not like the traditional male look. Um, you know, if you look behind me, I think you kind of see, and this is my, me and my daughter right over here. So, you know, trying to pave the way. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That's also very good advice. And, you know, I think things that we can definitely all think about. Um, you know, I think that throughout the, especially once COVID hit, I think that um, self-care became a little more important and more on the forefront of people's minds. And so, you know, going along with what we just talked about, I'm curious, do any of you have any, um, you know, specific kind of self-care rituals or, um, you know, uh, ideas that you would like to share with us? I know for me in particular, once COVID hit, I started using the Calm Meditation app and I do like a 10 minute meditation in the middle of every day, especially when I need to kind of decompress. And I do like to schedule do a little walk um, daily as well, just to get some fresh air. I find that that helps me. Um, do any of you have any, you know, just, yeah, like self-care ideas or, you know, rituals that you'd like to share with us? Yes. <laughs> Let's hear it, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you're going to think I'm not, but there is a purpose behind it. Um, I wake up it, like before the sun breaks, I wake up around 4, 4.30. Um, and that is self-care because I hate crowds. They stress me out, which means I, when the days that I come into the office, because we're a hybrid model, you know, I'm working at 6.30 in the morning and it's a joyful commute. If I were coming in at eight o'clock, I would be so frazzled by the time I arrived in the office. You know, so I time because I'm bang in the middle of New York City, I time all movements to avoid crowds. If I don't go to the museum on Saturday morning, I don't go to Zay bars on Saturday morning. You know, everything is timed for as much peace as possible throughout the day because that impacts then the rest of my day. So maybe 4.30 isn't your time, but I think, you know, lots of noise, lots of crowd, especially if you're in a location that is busy, you know, that's very important to me and in my routine. Um, and then, although I don't get to the gym these days, walking, nothing, you know, I will, that is my Zen. And during the week, it's much shorter. Maybe it's a 40 minute walk to the office. I'm lucky enough to feel to be close enough to the office, but on weekends, you know, if I can go hiking outside of the city, I will, but if I cannot, I'll still do a two and a half, three hour walk, you know, in the park and the level of sanity and peace it brings and actually processing because you think you're not doing anything. Maybe you're listening to music or whatever, but you come back and you have clarity on major life relationships, work decisions. You know, it's, it's sort of by osmosis without your having made an effort going through your mind. So whatever that movement is and it's free and you don't have to, you know, change in and out of gym clothes or whatever. It's super efficient time-wise, but I think that is a, a huge, uh, you know, building block in my life. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. I definitely agree with the walking. <laughs> That's, I think, it's definitely a great thing to do on a daily basis if you can, and definitely gets the blood flowing and clears the head a little bit. So thank you for sharing that with us, Apsar. Um, we have about 15 minutes left, so I wanted to just move to this concept of executive presence, which I think is a really um, important concept, just particularly for women. Um, so I would be curious, what tips um, do you ladies have for women to build and enhance their executive presence, particularly in this new norm of, you know, virtual meetings and interactions that we have? Um, so if we can start off with you, Danielle, on this one, that would be great. So, you know, I don't know if I have any really great tips on this other than um, when I first started out, I felt incredibly compelled to dress not feminine at all, right? The boxier the suit, the better, you know, the, the, the darker the color, the drabber. I felt like I needed to put my hair in a ponytail. Like, I, and I don't know what 
where this came from, but that was my perception. I graduated law school in 2005. That was my perception of what being professional was, right? So I always had my hair back and I always wore dark suits and, and I'm finding as I've gotten, you know, further along in my career that I'm, you know, I feel better when I'm wearing things that make me feel good. And I, you know, make an effort to, um, this is going to sound so, um, I don't know, crazy, but for a long time, you know, now it's starting to come back, but when I, I didn't today, but, um, usually when I have like a presentation, if there's an important presentation, I'll go get my hair blown out. Right. Because I feel better when I have a blowout, like silly, but like for me, like, I, you know, I'll do it. Like, and, and that actually started when we talk about environment, right? Like I shifted being in big law to being at Avon, the company for women. And the first time I had to present to the, um, audit committee at Avon, I was like, well, I'm going to go get my hair blown out before that. And then that started it from there on. Um, so, you know, just knowing like when you're going to feel your best and and setting yourself up so that when you have something that's important, you know, you're, you're feeling good. Um, I also think that exercise helps, right? So sometimes if I know I have something really important, like a big presentation to the government, or I'm having a big client meeting, I'll make a point to like, exercise that morning because if I, the clearer the head the you know the better I'll be able to present myself so a little silly but that's what I do no that's I think that's great Danielle and um and Danielle I was hoping you could also share with us we talked about this a little bit in the prep but I thought it was so cool the way you talked about some of your non-traditional oh. um ways of you your uh kind of, you know, spending time with your clients, because you talked about how, you know, this traditional way of what you thought oh. it was to, you know, be a lawyer <laughs> yeah. and dressing. And, sure. and I would love if you could tell us about, you know, cause some of the things that you do with your clients that may not be the most traditional. I said, when you told me, I wish I was one of your clients. So <laughs> I think it would be lovely if you could share that. So look, I have two young kids. I have a full-time job. I, you know, have a lot of responsibilities and I also need to maintain my relationships and, and, you know, continue to manage my book of business and my, my clients. Right. And so if I'm going to take time away from my work or time away from my family, then it's got to be a value add. So, um, for business development, you know, sometimes it's a really nice dinner, like somewhere, you know, like Maria, maybe like in, on uh, Columbus circle, like somewhere really fancy and special. Um, but more often it's, I'm taking a client to go get a blow out and a cup of coffee before a work day, or I'm taking a client to um, go get a manicure and pedicure and a smoothie at lunchtime. Um, you know, I had a, an event um, before COVID that was super fun. I had a bunch of clients at Bloomingdale's and I had a stylist come and she, everyone did a style quiz and she picked out outfits for each individual and we had champagne and snacks. Like, you know, for me, like, it, it has to be fun and I, and I want to enjoy it. And, and then, you know, my clients have fun because we're doing something fun. Right. Um, so going to what Avi said, it's about really enjoying what you're doing. I, I love being with, you know, other women and, and most of my clients are women, right? I have some male clients, you know, but on a whole, most of my clients are in-house counsel that are women, um, or, or referrals from other women. Um, so that's what I do. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. I love that. And I think it goes to what we were talking about earlier about being authentically yourself. And I think that that, you know, comes through when you're doing, you know, those types of things that you like to do with your clients. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and how about you, Afsar? What kind of tips do you have for women to build and enhance their executive presence? Exactly. So this one, I'll tell you this morning, I was preparing and my CEO was just kind of um, just pacing back and forth uh, right outside my office. And so I pulled out the glass and I said, do you need me for something? And he said, no. And I said, oh, so you're loitering. So because you did that, I'm going to rope you in to do some work. Like, and, and so I asked him, what do you understand by executive presence? Because um, I was trying to figure out exactly what you mean by the question. And he said, oh, okay. Yeah. It's about how you project yourself onto others. And before I even asked him anymore, he said, it's about how you project yourself onto others. And you know what, since it's about others, the only way to know you have it is to get feedback. So Walter, this one's for you. <laughs> but anyway, I thought that was so simple and so brilliant, which is, you know, there are all these tips we're giving and I'll have additional tips, but there's also a component of, you know, how did I do? 
you know, and, and depending on who you want to ask, it's not that every time you go and ask, or maybe you go and ask someone who's friendly versus someone who may be more difficult with you. But I actually thought the, com the feedback component was brilliant. And this goes back to what Cheryl earlier on had been saying also about getting feedback. Um, so that's one. I would also say, and this uh, builds on things we previously talked about, especially with Zoom, if you are a quieter person, you must talk. We had a senior leader meeting here a couple of weeks ago where someone said, you know, we don't pay people to think. We pay people to express what they are thinking. You know, if you thought and it never came out anywhere, you might as well have been out to lunch, you know? So therefore, if, if you're introverted it, it, and you prepare, you know, he, here's the topic of the Zoom, here are the two points I really wanna make during that or whatever you need to do or calling me in advance and saying, I'm gonna be shy, I know you're leading it, maybe you can team me up or something. Whatever it is, you have to be visible. And especially on Zoom, there are people who, will just have their photo off. Even when others are showing their faces, you can't do that. You have to be visible. Um, so that's, um, especially in these moments with Zoom, important. I would also say, um, you know, building up to being a good leader, which means you need to solicit input, be inclusive, get everybody's viewpoint, make everybody feel heard, and then be decisive around it. Everybody should have felt heard and included in the outcome, but you need to feel comfortable making a call if you need to make a call or just, you know, I had a conference call late last evening. All the juniors had all the brilliant ideas. I mean, they're the ones who actually gave the answers. And all I did was say, okay, so building on these four people, like this is what we're gonna do, just crystallizing it. Um, but that helped everybody. Um, and then, just building relationships. We've talked about this before, but I think if you're on Zoom, take the time or on a conference call in the old days, take the time to spend a few minutes talking about not just the work, but telling you know some people what you did over the weekend, asking them what they did for their holiday and so on. I think the relationships are important and help with work. And then just closing out um, to Daniel's point about the hair blowout, which is not in the least bit trite or silly or small. Um, Appearance matters. Be intentional about your appearance. You could be mess. We are all constantly messaging through our appearance things to everybody, including ourselves. And whatever that translates to, some for a woman, it may be, I don't want to wear makeup because I'm an empowered, liberated woman. Why do I? In my case, I wear makeup because it's war paint. You know, for me, that's what it means. I'm ready for battle and I'm going to slit your throat. You know, so like, plus it's my women folk that I grew up with and who are with me when I put on makeup because they were adoring and loving. And so therefore I am with a whole, like you don't see it, but there's a village of women around me right now, you know? And so I, I do think be intentional and thoughtful about your appearance. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you so much, Absa. That's really great advice. And I love your ability to just turn, you know, what is feminine into, you know, an energy in and of itself. I love your ability to do that. That's great. Um, and really great advice about how to, you know, present yourself, particularly on Zoom, which, you know, is this whole new world that we live in, but definitely can be a little bit harder to form those connections with people, you know, virtually, as opposed to if you were face to face with someone. So thank you very much for that advice. Really great. Um, we, uh, the last topic that we'll focus on here, um, that I wanted to focus on is networking. Um, you know, networking. Sorry, did we, did we ask Cheryl for her views on it? Uh, Cheryl's going to handle the networking. Gotcha. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Um, so, you know, it's this something that, you know, we all hear is important, but, you know, Cheryl, if I would really like, if you could focus on, you know, why is networking important? And, what advice and tips do you have for successful networking? And maybe, you know, what advice would you have to kind of, you know, get those cold introductions to, you know, kind of connect with people and, you know, what, what advice do you have with respect to that topic? Okay. Um, I would say that this is to me, one of the most important uh, questions, which is, um, you know, all about how you rise and it's all about building relationships. So, I like to use the words building relationships um, because some people 
when they hear networking and they're afraid to do it. And what I would say is just think of it in a different way. Think of it as building relationships and maybe then it'll feel more comfortable, natural, and fun. Um, I would say Danielle talked about a superpower um, of being um, that people, what's where when they underestimate, underestimated her. Um, and I certainly felt that when I was first starting out. And by the way, the greatest um, asset and weapon you can have in a courtroom against somebody who's going to underestimate you is preparation. And you don't have to have practiced 28 years to have that. You can really do great. You can um, you know, do an amazing job for your client and succeed based on prep, prep, prep. And I have certainly faced my male adversaries who looked at me and underestimated me and I was much better prepared than they were. And I walked away with everything that I wanted for my client. Um, but I'm going to say another superpower is likability. Um, all you need to grow a client base, and I'm going to talk about, but it, it goes to so many other things beyond clients, is likability. And I, how are you likable? Just be yourself. Just be yourself. Because people actually like who you are. and they. They, you know, it's kind of off-putting to meet somebody who's pretending to be somebody else or bigger than they are or whatever that is. Um, so just be yourself and form authentic relationships. Um, the, the ladies have mentioned, like when Danielle was talking about going to um, get your hair done and your nails done, I mean, that's her being her and doing what she enjoys doing because she's building a relationship that way. Um, I've built all my client relationships that way. And I talked about, I'm very passionate about DE and I, so I've almost all my clients I've gotten to know that way. All the the um, clients that have sustained this firm and grown this firm um, over what is it, fifteen years, um, are through that work. Um, and the ladies mentioned also Danielle mentioned helping other people. That is huge. If you want to succeed in the profession, helping others is a fantastic way to do it. So how can you do that? Somebody gives you a call and they're asking for legal advice. Even if it's not in your you know, realm, you may get to know people who can answer the question and you can put them in touch with people who can answer. You can start to do a little research yourself and then help them do that. Um, providing just good judgment, good advice, good feedback is doing that. Um, and when I talk about promoting others, um, you know, place echo promote, what Afsar just said about her um, CEO, I mean, what an incredible thing to say about him, that he's brilliant. You know, the words that she used to describe him, that he is his way of just instantly understanding, you know, executive presence and that, that you know, crystallized how she was going to talk about it. Um, she is building an, an ally there. I'm sure it's been growing over many years, um, but that's how you do it. Place Echo Promote, she is really promoting him to all of us and showing us how brilliant he is. Um, I, I want to say, by the way, to, to be a fair ally, that Scott Cooper is the person who had won the moot court competition the year before I did, and in 20 minutes told me how to present an argument in moot court. And it's thanks to that 20 minutes that I know how to argue a case, how to outline the brief that I'm going to write, and all those things. Um, and Karen Pollack, who connected me with Danielle and Afsar, um, is the reason I have incredible relationships with women like them. Um, and uh, Jamie's the, the reason that we had an incredible um, paralegal at our firm for a while um, because she had built that relationship with her. Um, so building relationships, there's a million ways in which it enhances your career. And I'm gonna also just one more tip on that. When you um, have junior people um, or you are a junior person, another tool you can use is recommend people for awards. That is a fantastic way to grow a coalition of allies. And so where you see talent, especially where it's a woman, a person of color, somebody who's from a dis historically disenfranchised group, LGBTQI, uh, uh, someone who's disabled, um, you see talent, you should be thinking, what award can I nominate them for? Um, you know, what memberships should I recommend that they be a part of? These kinds of things. They will, um, these kinds of things, they pay off in your, your social life and your well-being and your sanity um, and your happiness in the profession to have this group of coalition of allies helping. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That's great advice on networking. Um, 
we absolutely, I think, can all use that. Um, we have about two minutes left, so I just I'll pose it to Cheryl or you know anyone who maybe wants to answer this. We were talking about networking, and I know you know Danielle, you were touching on this a little bit earlier. But what would your advice be for you know kind of say you know I see someone who I look at their LinkedIn profile and I think you know they seem like they have a great career that I would want to learn more about, but I don't really know them. What would your advice be for kind of making those kind of cold introductions of yourself and kind of because I always find the hardest part of relationship building to be that initial first contact. So what kind of advice would you have for, you know, successful ways to kind of start that, you know, of trying to make a new connection, you know, to get yourself noticed or maybe to get a response when you're not sure if you will or not. Do you have any tips on that? Um, I would say one thing that LinkedIn is key for is that if you go to that person's profile, it will show you um, how you may be connected with them. And if there's a connection of yours that's connected with them, one thing you might want to do is reach out to your connection, find out or, you know, how well the connected they are and ask whether they may be able to connect you with them. If it has to be a cold kind of thing, I would reach out through the message um, function in LinkedIn and talk about, like, just be authentic and honest. Like, you have an amazing career, it, um, the likes of which I'd like to have one day. Is there any chance that we can have an e-coffee or we can meet face-to-face -face and talk? I don't know if Danielle and, and Ashley have other ideas. Uh, actually, I have a, a, just the other side of that, the flip side of the coin as someone who does sometimes receive those and does not reply. <laughs> don't take it personally. You know, there's some that I will reply to and back to the other question you asked beforehand, which is how do you manage to get balance? You know, so if I'm gonna deliver on my job, and have time for my significant other and my friends and you know get my walk in i do not have time for everybody and it's not personal it's just you know i get and it's not through linkedin necessarily i'll even get incoming from vendors somebody who saw me speak at a conference and it'll and they'll come in and you know i wish them the best i i really like them but it's you know there there's 24 hours in the day so if you don't get a response it's not a personal item you know it, it's just somebody else trying to live their life with the modicum of balance and move on and try it with the next person or connect in the in in ways that will be more fruitful you know so absolutely no i think that that's great advice to hear from the flip side as well absolutely it definitely goes back to what we were saying earlier that you know there is only so much time that we all have and we really have to make those priorities thank you so much for that um, all right, well, it looks like we are coming to the end of our time here today. So um, I wanted to thank our panelists, Afsar, Danielle, and Cheryl so much um, for your wonderful insight and advice. You know, I think so many of us attending today, including myself, can really find, you know, your advice um, really practical and, and something that could be implemented into our lives going forward. Uh, thank you so much to the Litigation Council of America, as well as the Diversity Law Institute for your support of women in the profession and for putting on, um, you know, this panel with us today. Thank you so much to Beth from Litigation Council of America for all her hard work planning um, this panel with us. It really you know, has been uh, amazing to work with you ladies, and I'm very honored to have been a part of it. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who attended today. I really hope you enjoyed our discussion and found it informative. So um, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day and a great weekend. Thank you so much. I'll just say it's Beth Rich, just so people know her last name. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.